Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark. Now, last week, I was looking at the new 8.2 release of the Databricks Runtime, and I saw that incredibly exciting new preview of the Databricks Change Feed, and I promised I'd do a video on it, so here we are. Now, this is super interesting. Basically, it's a way of storing just change data alongside your Delta table data. Now, if you're not too familiar with Delta, whenever you change a file, whenever you insert data, it stores it as Parquet. Parquet is immutable. You cannot open up and change a Parquet file. So the way Delta works is it takes the original Parquet file, it makes an entirely new version of that Parquet file with the changes inside, and it marks the old Parquet file as old. Now, if you had several hundred thousand records in your Parquet files, and you change one record across each individual file, that means you're duplicating your entire data set which is just how it works. That's the price we pay for having good column store compression in there. Now, if we're trying to read out the changes, so we can use things like Delta streaming, we can read out kind of version history of Delta, but it will give us the full file. So even if only one thing inside changed, we need to read all the records and go, well, this, this whole file got created. And that's not that efficient. So the change data feed is essentially a separate store that sits alongside our Delta that says, Oh yeah, it was just these two records that changed. And that suddenly opens up a whole world of efficiency for doing kind of trained um, data processing, for managing data pipelines, for publishing change feeds down to downstream applications. There's just a world of stuff you can do with it. So we're gonna open up, we're gonna have a look, we're gonna kind of step through a quick example, get an idea of how it works under the hood at the fire level. And then we'll go from there. As always, do not forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments if this is something you've been waiting for, if you've tried it out already, what you think. Useful? Not useful? Let me know. So let's see it in action. Okay, so before we dive into the example, I just want to jump in here. So there are some release notes. I'll share the release notes kind of link down in the comments. And there's a few things in here. So as it says, it's a change event stream so you can read the table and say rather than read the delta table i just want to read the delta tables change feed only tell me the things that have changed um and we'll have a look at how that works a few different examples of what it's used for and as easy as just add the table properties the same as enabling schema merge you can just say i want you to enable the change data feed so you can do it on a new table you can do it on an existing table obviously it won't capture the history and the historical changes for you um, or you can set it as a cluster config. So any table that gets created will automatically capture the change feed. Now, there is an overhead for capturing the change feed. You're storing more data. ETL is going to slow down a little bit because you're capturing more data each time. And obviously the storage costs. You're keeping another separate copy of that same data saying, well, this bit changed and this bit changed and this bit changed. So there's going to be storage overhead. So be aware there is a price to pay for turning on change data feed. But... It's quite powerful, so it's a... Other thing to note is once you've done that, um, because this is brand spanking new 8.2 functionality, once you've turned that on for a table, you can no longer write that table using 8.1 or earlier. So it's like a, as soon as you've adopted it, you'll now have to use the most recent versions of Databricks for this to actually work. Again, currently in preview. Just don't use it in production just yet, but really good thing to look at and start digging into. And then we've got a load of examples, lots of different things about how you use it, but I'll take you through that myself. So, okay. So I've got a, just a empty folder. I pulled out a log example. We'll look at that in a little bit, but essentially I'm going to use this as a root folder and create a Delta table from there. Now I've got a quick um, sample notebook. So I used this when I was first demoing uh, Delta mergers. So this is kind of an existing notebook that I just retrofitted to say, let's do the same thing. So, okay, we're going to create a blank table. So we're going to get changing dot addresses. I'm giving it a few columnar bits. I'm saying it's Delta. I'm telling it where to store it. And I'm including that all important table properties. Delta dot enable change feed is true. Okay, so I've ran that. So now we'll see I've got my empty Delta table. No data in there. And I've got a Delta log. And there's nothing different at all about that table. That is bog standard. Standard works the same way wherever it is. I can go and insert some data. Again, that'll go through. It'll create some Parquet files. It'll update my Delta transaction log. So I can go and I've got my Parquet file. 
and I don't see anything different. And that, that, that was a bit weird at first. I was looking at it going, well, where's, where's, the, where's the CDC? How do I see what's changed? Uh, and that was a little gotcha that got me at first in that there's nothing in here that tells me that CDC is actually enabled that I could see. It's just so far, because I've just done an insert, working as a normal Delta table. And that's because of the type of interaction I've done. Because it was a blank insert, because I was just like, these are all new records. There's no chain. I'm not deleting anything. I'm not updating anything. Just take this new data. It doesn't need to keep a separate copy. It knows everything inside that transaction. Therefore, everything inside the new parquet files that are added, they're all inserts. It can infer that. It doesn't have to store that separately. So don't be put off if you start using CDC and you do a lot of inserts and you don't see anything because that's how it's meant to work. It's nice and efficient. Okay, I've then got a, I'm just making a view of some contrived update data. I'm doing a merge of that update data into my table. It's doing it slowly changing, styly. So we'll get kind of um, an update to an old record to mark its end date, an insert of the new record, and a few things like that. So firstly, we get the nice stats these days, which is really good. So I can see I've inserted, so I've affected three records. One of those was an update, two of those were flat inserts. So I'm expecting to see some changes in my data. Something has changed that we can go and have a look at. So I can see I've got two copies for 11 now, one with an end date, I've got a new date, I've got current true. I have applied my changes into that data. Okay, so traditional merge, nothing crazy, but because we've now done an update style change, if I hit refresh, see I've got the new parquet that was the result of that update, and I've got this, change data. So it's another metadata folder that sits alongside the Delta log, which starts to capture, oh, that was either a merge or an update or a delete operation. Therefore, I need to capture what happened inside the operation at the row by row level. So I've got my change data and I've got my separate parquet file that tells me what went on inside there. It's pretty cool. So anytime I make an update, it does two things. It updates the actual core parquet file so I still get my normal parquet file that's part of the Delta table, but it creates a second copy of that data that was affected by that change that has additional metadata in there. What happened to it was an update, was an insert. Um, and we can go and have a look at that. So be aware, you're now keeping this second tracked copy of the data. And we go have a look in the Delta log, I'm gonna grab that. So you can see we've got that CDC line that's been added. Uh, I think if we just dive in here, I've got a copy of it I made. Let's just tidy that up. So you can see in this new log, we've got a few things. We did a merge, and so we've stored all the predicates, which is nice. We've got all that nice merge stats, so we can see all that same thing that came out. We can see we made an old file obsolete because we've got a new copy of it. We've got a new copy of that parquet file. We've got that all important CDC record saying we've added a new parquet file to the CDC record that represents this whole transaction. It's got a load of data in there. So super interesting that we've got this kind of different mechanism for storing and capturing data and working with that stuff. But what did it look like, you say? How do we actually use that? Um, so, I mean, I went and just read a copy of the parquet that's stored and you can kind of get an idea of how it's working in that essentially inside that change data feed. So inside this file that's sitting, whoops, what up? Inside that change data file, I kind of took a copy of one of those Parquet files, did a quick read of it, said, what does that look like? And essentially it's an exact carbon copy of the data, but it says what happened as a part of that. Now, interestingly, for any row that was updated, we've got two records. We've got the, what did it used to look like? And what does it look like now? That feels slightly bizarre. Uh, I'm doubling up for all of my updates. And so if I want to get an actual change feed, if I want to get a, no, just, just tell me the new the new changes I should apply. I kind of have to filter out the pre-image ones, which is weird, but still more data better, I guess, unless you don't like storage costs. Um, okay, let's look at a practical example of that. So I'm just going to get the history up for that Delta table. So I've got version zero, one, and two. And zero was just the empty table. One is when I first inserted some rows. And then version two is what we're interested in. Version two we should actually see something that looks a lot like that table. So we should see four record being changed and that kind of update uh, into pre-image. So we've got the same idea. So we're saying, I want to, so this is the new syntax. I want to select star from table changes. Table changes is saying, 
I want to call essentially a CDC function. Don't read the table normally. Don't just go select star from changing addresses. I want you to go and read the underlying change data feed that's associated to this table. And then I can give it a version. So I can say between one and two. So just give me the changes between these two versions. I can omit the latter one and say from version two onwards, tell me everything's changed since then. Um, you got a little bit of control. Uh, I can do it as timestamps. So I could actually pass in kind of the, everything has changed since, you know, kind of whatever timestamp I put in to try and isolate those changes. So it's quite nice to be able to kind of just have that temporal controls exactly the same as when you query a Delta table and you say version as of timestamp as of similar kind of functionality. Uh, and you can see I'm filtering out that update pre-image. Basically saying, don't show me the duplicate of what it used to look like and what it looks like now. Just show me the new interesting stuff. You can see same data, gives me that insert, gives me the post image, gives me the insert. It also, so on top of what was actually inside that um, change feed, the change feed just has the change type in there, but it, we also get the commit version and the commit timestamp. And essentially it's tagging it to that bit of metadata we had coming from um, the Delta log. So basically it's reading this thing. It's looking at, well, this was version two. So if this change, if this CDC change linked up to this version two, then we can grab the commit info from there. We can, we know what happened in there, what the Delta version was and what the timestamp version was. So if we're going over many, so we could say between zero, two, we could pull in the changes to get across several different Delta versions. So from version one to version two, different commit timestamps. So it seems quite nice and efficient. Essentially, if the type of transaction you were doing with the Delta table was a pure insert, it's just going to read the standard parquet. If it was an update, if it was a merge, if it was a delete, not a partition delete, deleting a full partition, but a just a straight delete a couple of records from inside a file, then it'll create that second cloned copy of that data, and it'll read that one instead. So when you say, tell me all these changes, it's deciding, does it read the main parquet, or does it read the change feed, depending on the type of operation for that delta log uh, record. So interesting, doing different stuff. Essentially, these ones, the flat inserts, are coming from the normal Delta table. These ones are coming from that new change feed. Now, obviously, that's going to add to storage costs. You're going to have more data. You're storing duplicate copies of your data anytime you update, uh, update data as a result of a merge, as a result of um, something that might, might uh, update records. So if you do a merge and it updates one record and inserts thousands and thousands, you're going to have duplicate copies of, of all of those thousands of inserted because they're inserted as part of a merge transaction. Now, the good news is the vacuum uh, activity, which you should be doing on your tables anyway if you're working with Delta, especially if you're using merges, the vacuum will, will go and clean up your CDC feed as well. So if you're going to vacuum from seven days, it'll get rid of the um, change feed from seven days ago. So it is kind of, again, be aware of when you're dealing with your vacuum and how how uh, up to date you need it, how that length of history you need it is. Um, I'm not dug into any of the semantics, if there's any nuance with how you need to do vacuuming now. Uh, but yeah, makes sense. You can use that same operation to clean down your data. So it's all good. Uh, final thing to note is that you can also do this as a stream. So rather than using our um, kind of normal, I just want to select from my change, uh, my table changes. I can have a stream which is going to constantly kick out the results of that. The same you can stream from a Delta table, but instead of going and reading that other kind of um, you know, every big chunky file that's changed, it's just reading the change feed and giving us the extra info from there. So that's efficient. So as we put stuff in there, it's going to kick out those changes and then we can take those changes and apply them further downstream. So definitely interesting stuff. There's interesting things going on inside there. And there's lots that we can do looking at that um, using streaming to say, essentially, how can we efficiently have this kind of our whole data leg as this knock on streaming now? How can we push these changes down efficiently? How can we build out, you know, kind of merges into later stages that are doing that CRUD style update, doing the apply the inserts this way, updates this way, and deletes that way, and actually build it in so it properly maintains things rather than having to do big, big chunky merge statements across the entirety of our data set. Loads and loads and loads of things we can do in there. So I'll be digging further into it, looking at some uh, design patterns, looking at some of the more funky stuff we can do out of it. But 
on the whole, looks pretty cool. Looks super useful for kind of just figuring out what's going on inside our data and being able to pull that stuff out more efficiently. So, yeah, yeah. Got lots of things to go and think about how we plug it into designs, how we can better use that. And do, are we mainly using that when like landing data into our kind of middle layer or silver layer, kind of kind of our idea of what that kind of, um, almost like an ODS uh, in terms of how advanced analytics use it? Or do we use it when merging into facts and dimensions? Can it make things, building things like slowly changing dimensions a little bit easier to reverse engineer rather than actually having to really carefully curate and maintain these things? So lots of interesting potential ideas that we need to dig into and we need to understand because it's very, very new. So in a nutshell, that is the new Databricks change feed. So you do need to be using Databricks runtime 8.2 to get hold of that. As far as I know, it is just a Databricks thing. I've not seen anything about it in uh, Delta IO, the kind of open source version of Delta Lake. Who knows in the future, but for now it is very much a Databricks thing and it is in preview. So pinch of salt. Don't use that heavily in production. Don't know if there's any weird performance things. What happens if you write a really gnarly query over the top of it? How does that, how's it going to perform? Will it take advantage of Bloom indexes? And kind of, can we make it more efficient about when it's finding data? Don't know. So many questions about how we use this in anger, how we use this over large tables, how it performs at scale. Uh, and it's a, a little bit early to tell, honestly, but as a step in the right direction, as a bit of functionality that has so many uses, it's exciting times. All right, I will leave you there. As, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Hope you enjoy the video. And as always, let us know in the comments if there's any other things you would like us to dig into or questions or musings, or you just want to say hello. It's all good. All right, see you next time. Cheers.